Coming up is a presentation from our App Masters Connect event in Santa Monica, where you will discover how Jake Ellenberg, CMO at X Mode, drove millions of downloads for Drunk Mode, primarily through press. Listen to why not porn was his favorite subject line, how he hacked LinkedIn to get connected to reporters, and why you should not land all of your desired press at once. Stay tuned on the next chat. Stay tuned. Over, nice. Okay, <laughs> welcome. Uh, I thought of this fake news that you can too, uh, because I mean, like, of course, we all hear about the term fake news, right? But all news is fake. Um, it, it may be a real story, but how it got to the person that wrote about it was usually uh, sensationalized, right? So even when Donald Trump's sitting here talking about CNN being fake news, he watches Fox News every day. It's just as fake, uh, if not more. Um, but, you know, that's whatever. Uh, so I'm Jake, the Chief Marketing Officer of Exmo, graduated from the University of Alabama uh, about two years ago. Um, a lot of people know this, the University of Alabama is actually the top five PR school in the nation. Uh, we beat out Syracuse, so something like Syracuse. <laughs> um, I helped us get drunk mode to over 1.5 million downloads, mainly leveraging growth hacking, which is you know, a lot of uh, people either have a negative con you know, conversation with, uh, but then a lot of that was also press. I'd say out of the 1.5 million, almost you know, 700 something thousand came from press. Um, I've also put over 300 hours into Skyrim. It's a lot of fun, by the way, if you haven't. So we never Skyrim? It's a video game. <laughs> <laughs> Elder Scrolls? Have you ever heard of Elder Scrolls? Any of those? Anyway, so. <laughs> and uh, I know the way, uh, which is a, a very popular name. So. Uh, anyway, uh, the press really loved Drunk Mug. Um, it was this app that pretty much, or it's still in the App Store, really buggy, so don't download it right now. We're planning on a relaunch in the future. Uh, Drunk Mode came out around 2013, and uh, with 10,000 downloads, Josh pretty much met me while I was in college and said, I was like, hey man, your marketing is trash. Uh, you know, your message is so spammy that like, because Josh, our CEO, is, <laughs> our CEO is so good at getting the message in front of people, right? Like he's so good at finding these growth hacks, these, red, or these avenues to kind of like tell people about what the app is. But then when he would get in front of them, he would freeze. You know, like it was kind of like uh, the, the message just wasn't there. So I came on and said, hey man, uh, you know, let me help you with that. And uh, he let me. <laughs> and so uh, I got us into, we were at 10K downloads. I got us, one of the first news articles I ever got us in was the Huffington Post one, uh, where they told us that we were redefining the college experience. Um, and then I was able to use that to pretty much get us in everything else you see here. Uh, there was a lot more, by the way. These are just some of my favorite ones. Uh, the USA Today, uh, actually on live television, said that Josh should win a Nobel Prize. And I was like, <laughs> yes. I was like, all right then, we made an app for drunk college students, but sure, I'll take that Nobel Prize over a lot of peace efforts. Um, and so, you know, it was one of those things, uh, and you know, I can get into this a little more, I'm not sure if I have a slide on it, but it's, it's link economy. And, and that's an important word to remember is link economy. No one wants to be the first to drink <laughs> Surprisingly, like everybody always thinks like, okay, you know, like you want to be the first to get that scoop, right? Being the first to get that scoop comes with a negative thing. That scoop can be wrong. And then you're, you know, you lose your journalistic integrity, right? And so one of the biggest things to do is provide link economy. After you get into Huffington Post, which is pretty easy to get into, honestly, like, I mean, there's HuffPo College, there's HuffPo, like everything. And you can find a writer, honestly, like they get paid too. Like some of them you can pay 500 bucks, they'll write an article for you, right? Well, that sounds, Terrible. What you do is you pay 500 bucks for that article, you take that article, you send it over to a guy in the Wall Street Journal, TechCrunch, MTV, any, any, anything, right? The biggest thing is to remember, where's our market and who are we trying to hit? This was a drunk college app. MTV News crushed it. We got 75,000 downloads in three days off the MTV News article. Okay? So, and, and that's something that like was, that was free, by the way. I think I made 500 bucks that month, because we were bootstrapping, right? And so, uh, as CMO, I still only made like 500 bucks the, the month that I brought in almost 100,000 downloads to this platform, right? For free. Um, and so you basically take one of these articles, whenever you can get like something like this, uh, MTV News called us life changing. Since that day, our entire title has been drunk mode, the app MTV called life changing, right? 
And that, you know, it adds to the brand in a way. They're like, okay, I know who MTV is. I know that, you know, back in the 90s, they used to party at PCB. Panama City Beach, by the way, for all you Yankees. Uh, anyway, so it's one of those things where, like, you know, with Link Economy, you can kind of help prove that story, help make it to where, like, I am somebody. Please write about me. And so, anyway. Um, so how do we do it? LinkedIn was a major key. Uh, it was one of those things where I was a, uh, you know, I was a college student at the University of Alabama, uh, junior, sophomore, I believe. Uh, I knew nobody in press, right? I'm a nobody. They don't know me. I'm just a kid in Alabama, right? Uh, so LinkedIn was awesome. I pretty much made my LinkedIn make it look like I was the most professional CMO you had ever seen of a drunk college app, right? Like they were like, this dude is legit. Like I'm over here using my past work at you know Walmart as a cart pusher, as a courtesy associate, you know, and like so, you know, like I'm making everything sound good because that's part of the framing, which we'll get into later. But uh, LinkedIn was a major way because I was able to not just add journalists that I wanted to get in touch with, but then add like, you know how it works with the second degree connection, third degree connection. So I was sitting here adding like, you know, different people from like Arby's or whatever, just because they were friends with a tech crunch writer, right? Just to become a first connection with him and then add him and then get in there and get my story. A lot of people don't realize this. A lot of people use their personal emails when signing up for social media. LinkedIn in its beginning was one of these social medias that a lot of people use their personal email for. So I wasn't contacting Lucas at TechCrunch. I was contacting Lucas09 at yeah, like Google or gmail.com. And I was sifting through all the bullshit he was getting, right? Because TechCrunch article or journalist, Mashable, all these guys are getting hundreds of pitches a day from people like myself, yourself. I mean, you can hire the best PR guy in the world, but if he's cold reaching out to a guy and can't get their attention, then it doesn't matter, right? And so LinkedIn was a major key. Twitter also helped. A lot of journalists have their uh, you know, email in their bio, so that's always super helpful. You can kind of like reach out to them directly. And then, of course, research before you send anything. You don't want to send a tech pitch to the food article guy. You know, uh, that's just like, that's just one easy way to not get noticed or not get rid of that. Because if I'm an auto journalist and uh, you just sent me a pitch for your dope app that has nothing to do with cars, I'm going to be like, okay, thanks for wasting my time. Uh, you know, and I'm, we're not going to write about you. I'm not going to get you to the guy who writes about apps because you should have reached out to him, right? A lot of these dudes don't talk either, so that's interesting. We worked at AOL for a couple of years. They owned TechCrunch and still couldn't get us into TechCrunch. I had to do that to buy myself. Um, so, <laughs> uh, and be respectful at all times. Uh, I know that sounds easy, but like, I feel like some people can get a little heated when they're told no. Um, and that's one thing that I had to tell a lot of people on my team whenever they were helping me reach out to press is like, you're gonna have a dude that's like, get, get out of my face, this is noise, or this is trash, you know, like your app sucks, I don't wanna talk about it. Mashable still hasn't wrote about us and still gave me the most no's. I was always so nice to that lady, she was always so mean to me about that, and I was just <laughs> always like, okay man, well I'll let you know whenever we hit, you know, like a bigger number. 1.5 million downloads on a drunk college app was not enough to get Mashable to go, this sounds interesting, right? But the Wall Street Journal, wrote about it. <laughs> Who the hell is Mashable? Am I right? Anyway, anyway this is now going to become a thing of me saying fuck Mashable. But anyway, um, I always get their name right too. That's a huge thing that people forget. It, it's so, it's just, it, it's little things. And maybe because I'm from the South, right? Just respectful. Right? I, 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 <laughs> I, I try to get folks' names right. I try to remember them, but in an email specifically, you have time to double check that shit. Like in person, I may forget yours or whatever. But on an email, you have time to go to their LinkedIn. Make sure you got the spelling right. Make sure you did this. Because it just for them, my name's Jake. When I get emails to Jim or to Josh, which is our boss, they get deleted, right? He doesn't get them. It could be super important. I don't care. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> pitching and framing is super important. You want to make your pitch fun to read. Like I said, these are people. They're not robots. Uh, and make sure you have a story. And this is a big thing that I have to drop home to app developers, and I had to drop home to our own team, too. A story to you is not a story to them all the time, right? We work so hard on our babies. We see these apps grow, and we see them, like, become, you know, all this cool shit, and we're like, oh, my God, you know, like... But it's, it's, it's not news sometimes, right? Like, a lot of these apps, and I mean, just to be frank, drunk mode wasn't groundbreaking technology. You could use Find My Friends if you wanted to, and basically have the same effect. But the branding and everything brought people to drunk mode, right? And it was like, it's one of those things where we kind of had to make it a story, right? Because the technology's already out there for a lot of these things. We're just innovating, making new ways to do it, making new stories and new ways to use that technology, right? And so that's really like how you have to handle the situation is you kind of have to step back and take yourself out of that bubble and say like, 
you know, what's news about this? You know, like, if I wasn't working here, would I read this article? You know? Um, and get their attention, right? One of my favorite subject lines was not porn. Okay? It did phenomenal. <laughs> not porn got us in the tech crunch, MTV, a lot of those ones you saw. The subject line was not porn. I grew up in the 90s and uh, you know, was early on in computers and stuff, and so one of the few things I remember was whenever you got an email from a sketchy thing, I'll click on it, it's probably, you know, or it's something weird, it's a virus, right? You know? And so like, uh, and, and I think that's why a lot of 90s kids and stuff have uh, like PTSD when it comes to like bars on uh, screens, like uh, uh, banners, right? They're dead to my generation. So if you're using banners, stop it. Um, <laughs> it's one of those things where like they've actually done eye tests. Boomers look at banners, millennials do not. We like just have this weird association with banners and clickbait and spam, right? And I think it's the same for emails for a lot of folks. And so my favorite thing was to get their attention. The subject line, <laughs> the thing about PR, is that your professors or whoever you talk to is going to tell you, make your subject line the headline, right? Because it, it makes their job easier as a journalist if they, you, you can just hang on the headline right here, right? Uh, mine was always not about that life. It was just about getting their attention. <laughs> they made them laugh, dude. These people get hundreds of emails a day, mainly from app developers, and no offense, aren't always the funniest folks, right? Like they usually don't <laughs> crush it at the Apollo, right? These are usually your introverts, folks like that. And so the pitches that they're giving these folks can be the same monotonic bullshit that they see every day, right? And so it's super important to kind of like make it attention grabbing, right? And, and you always want to know who you're talking to. Uh, treating them like friends helps. The way I'm conversating with you guys, right? This is how I talk to journalists. This is how I talk to my CEO. This is how I talk to my mom. This is how I talk to my friends. You know, this is just how we talk, right? And it's like we forget that when we're trying to talk business or we try to pitch something and we click in this like business mode that to me is just so like, um, standoffish and so uh like i don't know I, I, don't, I don't mean to be the one that's like you know bring it all down but goldman sachs went business cash okay so like <laughs> take it down a notch um and then make it exclusive this is a big thing like you know a lot of people don't want to be the scoop but if they can be the exclusive interview right of somebody who's generated press in the past that was a big thing that we did after we generated a lot of press it was like well if you'd like we can set up an interview with our ceo who helped drive us this amount of downloads and you know, maybe you could talk about how we use certain growth hacking techniques and all that. So give them an exclusive, make them feel as if they're getting a scoop or something special in a way is always a great way to frame your story and get it recognized, right? Um, know what you're pitching. This may seem like common sense, but know what the hell you're talking about. You know, like just knowing your product front and back. Uh, this, this actually is more so for folks who are thinking about hiring outside PR firms or outside folks to come in. Make sure they know who you are. Make sure they're working hand in foot. Like the lady said earlier, she said, I've worked for Heal, right? And that's how it is. When you're a PR person, like my name, Jake Ellenberg, was never being pitched. It was always Josh Anton. It was always drunk mode, right? And it's Josh Anton's our CEO, by the way. Uh, so the story was never about me. You know, it's always about the team, the company, and what everybody else is doing. And so you have to, like, you have to make sure you know the product. You have to make sure you know the people behind the product. And I know it sounds easy, but it's just one of those things where a lot of people, you'll, a journalist will start asking questions, and you won't have answers to those questions, and then he may not write about you. And so, so know why you're pitching, too, is super important. Don't just get pressed to get it. A lot of people are like, oh, our name needs to be out there. Brand, right? Brand recognition, all this, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's not really. Like, you know, sometimes you don't need press. For X mode, uh, we dabble in the anonymous location data industry, right? And it's one of those gray areas where a lot of folks still like, they feel like either it's a, it's a you know, huge invasion of privacy, or the flip side, uh, I have Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, all these are selling my location data, I don't give a shit, just give me a cool app, right? And so it kind of like flip flops between those two. So with X mode, it's important to pretty much like get press in specific areas, right? Like Unicast is a good blog, a couple of other ones that like are specifically for our industry. Drunk mode, did okay for the Wall Street Journal, but the Wall Street Journal story was more about the company and what we had built, not necessarily trying to drive traffic. Whereas the MTV News article definitely drove downloads, definitely drove traffic, and that's one of those where, like, you know, you have to know who you're pitching to and all that. And uh, so you know why you need to get press. Don't just think I need a bunch of downloads. I want to get them free. PR is a great way to do it. It is, but at the same time, you may not want those problems. Uh, a lot of stuff comes with press. It's being known, right? It's also Hundreds of thousands of users. Increased server costs. That's a big thing. When I crashed our servers at Drunk Mode, it was a huge day for me. I was so happy. 
tech team not so much. <laughs> like they're they're over here like holy shit the house is on fire and I'm like yeah we're in there <laughs> we got it and so like um, it's one of those things where be ready right like don't just go out there pitching like crazy make sure you have the money for the servers make sure you have the stuff where this app isn't crashing the day we got into MTV News and the next day and then we were actually one of the first apps to ever trend in the app store uh, when iOS nine first came out the uh, I would say I had <laughs> so whenever the uh, the trending bar first started, right? Like, as soon as you updated, we were the first app trending on iOS, like, in the mm-hmm. trending spot. Cool. And so, the day that happened, you know, we're over here like, holy shit, what's going on? We didn't get pressed, we didn't get anything, like, what's happening? We were trending, one of the first apps ever trending. And so, we just weren't prepared for it. And it's one of those things where, like, you gotta have the money, and you gotta have everything together, and then when press, <sighs> American syndication is one of the most beautiful things, in my opinion. Uh, the fact that, like, Everybody wants to talk about the same thing, or everybody doesn't want to be the last person to tell that story, right? So, like when when uh, TechCrunch picks it up, then someone else is like, "Oh shit, TechCrunch is right about it. Let's write about it." So it causes this like windfall, right? To where like you could have gotten this one article and you thought that's dope, that's all I needed. I hit my download numbers. It's a snowball now, and you don't have the money or the team or anything to keep up with all this bullshit that's happening. Then somebody found something about your app they didn't like. Yeah, and then, you know, like, it's just, it's one of those things where sometimes you don't want those problems, right? And so it's best to be kind of prepared for those. You want to set up press plans. Like, what is next? What are we going to do? When they write this article, who am I sending it to next to keep that link economy going? And so those are all just important things to remember. And so you want to slow your roll a little bit. You don't want to land everything at once. This was a big thing we did at Drunk Mode. I attacked everything. We blitzkrieged the press. That's how we went down. And uh, it pretty much led to everybody being like, okay, so what are you doing now? Like when we got into MTV, Josh, a few months later, CEO was like, hey, uh, we need a few more downloads. You want to try to get to MTV again? And I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll try it. Send the pitch. They immediately are like, same app we wrote about two, three months ago. And I'm like, in a way, but we have more downloads now. You know, and they're like, that's not news. Get out of my face. Uh, and so it's one of those things where like, you want to trickle in your press. You don't want to hit everything at once. And if you do, you want to make sure that you have something next. You have a story that's going to continue. You have something that you're doing next that's going to keep it rolling, right? Because you want to make it count. Make sure your product's where it's at is where it's at before you get the exposure. A lot of people, including our CEO, is one of those fire by bat- or baptism by fire type, right? Where you just kind of throw that shit out there and let it go and figure it out. Uh, I'm a planner. <laughs> I like to you know, sit back and say, okay, uh, let's make sure we can handle this whenever all this stuff starts going crazy. And so... That's where I always say is make it count, make sure that you have the processes, everything in place that you're going to want to do whenever you do land that press because it can end up being a snowball effect. Um, and just be you. I know it sounds silly, but it's really like genuineness comes out. People feel it, man. Like they feel, people understand when you're fake, right? Like they can feel it, your fake laughs, fake looks. <laughs> they, they know, right? Like they know. And so and you can even tell it in emails. It's weird. It's just like, just, just coming off genuine and you know telling people about your product, telling them about yourself even, is it, just one of those things that can be uh, you know, really helpful when it comes to pitch and press. And, and also, ask if I didn't work for the company, would I read this? Would I write about this? Would I, would I find this interesting, right? And, and if so, then yeah, you probably have a story. You should probably find the right avenue to pitch that to. If not, then yeah, you don't have a story <laughs> and you work there. So if you're not hyped about it, then there's probably some problems. Um, but be friendly to journalists, and they might be friendly back. One of the biggest things I learned, uh, I reached out to a VH1 writer, um, and he pretty much emailed me back and was like, hey man, not going to write about the story. First off, he was an auto journalist, so I didn't follow my own rule there. These are all, uh, you know, stuff that I've learned from the States, by the way, so. <laughs> um, he was an auto journalist. He said, you know, I don't write about apps, but I like your idea. I'm going to help you. Here's how you should be framing your pitch. Here's how you should be writing that pitch. Here's how journalists like to read. He gave me all that information. The next pitch I wrote, boom, we landed. Right? It was one of those things where like journalists know how they want to see stuff. And so if you just ask them, you know, like, how should I be pitching this to you? Or like, you know, they'll actually like think, oh man, you know, I've never really been asked that. So here's the information I'd like to have. Yeah, and then you give it to them, and boom, you've already established a relationship with that person. You know, you're emailing back and forth. You made them feel like I'm a human, you're a human, let's be people, right? <laughs> Instead of like weird email robots. And so, um, and even if they say no, follow back and thank them for their time. People's time is the most valuable thing they have, right? And if they took the time to read your email and give you a no, the least you can do is email them back and thank them, right? And I know that sounds ridiculous, 
But at the end of the day, we have people tell us no, that then due to like just respectfulness and being nice and everything, come back around later on and say, hey, you know, we're actually writing a story about a couple of guys. That's how the Wall Street Journal article happened. They told us no multiple times. We kept the relationship open. Finally, he wanted to do a story on the advancements in mobile technology, and he used a stupid drunk college app to do so in a huge newspaper that was syndicated, right? And so it's one of those things where just being respectful can get you a long way. I mean, I shouldn't have to tell you guys this. You all seem like some outstanding citizens, but it's, you know, it's even if they say no, you know, think of it at a time. And so, any questions, comments, concerns? That's pretty much all I have. I know it's a brief overview, and it's very, like, not really high level, but I didn't really know where everybody was, you know? <laughs> and so it's one of those things where, like, uh, if you have any questions, uh, just let me know. My, uh, my email is jake at xmodesocial.com. Uh, like I said, Xmode helps apps monetize on their location data and everything, and, uh, and a part of being on the Xmode platform is help with PR, marketing, stuff like that. And so uh, I'd be your go, your go-to guy, you know, so. Uh, but any questions? Yes? What uh, did the auto writer tell you about pitching over the email? Um, he pretty much gave it bullet points, man. A big thing is bullet points. Uh, people, no one wants to read a wall of text, right? And so a lot of us, like, you know, we're techie guys, and so we sit down and read, like, oh, this is the most amazing app you'll ever use, blah, blah, blah. Like, start going through and don't realize that it had become a, uh, a wall of text with no too long didn't read or anything like that. Uh, journalists, it's all a time thing. And they want to be able to get your story written, get it out there as fast as possible. We're not in the era of print media anymore, for real. That shit's dying. Uh, digital is definitely going to be the way to go, especially for blogs and everything like that. Do I like that? No. I don't like it. It's pay-per-click, pretty much. And so it kind of takes away from the actual essence of news, in my opinion, but that's a whole different conversation. Um, so it's like, yeah. So it's one of those things where, uh, yeah, just bullet points. Cool. Keep it as smooth as simple. And like, these are the big facts about us, and we'd love for you to write about us. You know, is there anything you would like to know that I didn't tell you, kind of thing? Cool. Yeah, Did mostly. Does getting smaller coverage, like, in, you know, we're most familiar with games, if you got in, like, Pocket Gamer or these other types of smaller outlets, does that hurt your ability to go and pitch, like, an Huffington Post or somebody else? Or, like you said, link economy wise, does it, does it add value? I think it helps with the link economy, personally. Um, yeah, I would definitely say it would help with the link economy. I don't think it would hurt in any way. Um, the only way it would hurt is if the journalist looked at it as this is something that's already been written about. Mm -hmm. But usually, when it's smaller things, like smaller blogs, stuff like that, they still feel like they can be the story, right? Our platform's bigger than theirs, so I can still break that story. Whereas when we were getting into MTV, TechCrunch, all that, when I go back around to HuffPo, they're like, I'm not write about it. Like, you guys are everywhere right now. You know, like, so that's the only time it's negative is whenever it, you know, the bigger ones have already kind of like saturated in a way, you know? But with smaller ones, now I think that only helps with link economy. And as soon as some of those get written, I would, do, I would be building those links and be thinking of the bigger guys that I want to target with the small links. <coughs> Yeah, so sometimes when we pitch the press, we say like this will be exclusive story for you. Mm -hmm. But then you pitch both multiple press at the same time, telling them it's all exclusive yeah. story. Then what if the one picks the story first and it becomes non exclusive for others? So how? Um, it just that? depends on morally how you feel about that, really. I um, mean, okay. they don't care. They actually don't Did the press get, they don't talk usually. Like, I mean, like most of the time, a journalist from TechCrunch is only talking to other journalists from TechCrunch. I mean, he may read some other stuff or whatever, but usually, if they're a far enough apart, they're never going to see your article. The other thing, um, the big thing to remember about exclusives and like how I usually feel about them is I kind of give it to who bites back first. I pitch it to all these folks, and if you're the first one to tell me you're interested, then I kind of like give it to you, and then I let the other folks know if they ever come back or ever ask anything that, like, you know. Kind of, you know, here's the article in a way. And so it's really like, my big thing about pitching um, exclusives is to pitch it to everybody and then give it to the fish that bites in a way. Like, what do you think about fish is like? <laughs> I mean, then it's up to you if you want to give it to everybody. I, I would definitely pick one that I would let like break the story right. You know, you, you need to sit back and look at the different ones that are biting and say, this one's going to hit our target better, or this one's going to hit our target better. And if they're all going to hit your target, then I would let them all kind of write about it and then just be like, oops. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, you know, I didn't know like someone else was. I mean, they're never going to call you out on it. Like that's just one of the things is that they're too busy. Yeah, most of the time these people write this article and then they're on with the next one. They forget about yours in a way. And I know it sounds shitty, but that's just like it's a 24-hour news cycle. People are always constantly hungry for news. We're talking about Huffington Post almost got sued by Reddit because within an hour something hit in the front page of Reddit, it was a news story on Huffington Post, right? And so Reddit came to Huffington and was like, hey. 
uh, if you don't quit stealing our shit, we're going to sue you. And Huffpo had to back off and start doing real journalism, you know. Um, and so, I mean, that's tough. Don't ask journalists to do that. Um, but yeah, so I, I would definitely, uh, I've given exclusives to multiple people. You know, it's, it's one of those things where, yeah, it, it, may not, it may not sound the most, you know, like greatest thing, but they, they usually don't find out. And, you know, usually it's, it's never anything negative. Because most of the time, whenever they're writing the story, they don't mention that it was an exclusive given to them. You know, unless, it's, unless you're Kanye or something like that. And then they're like, you got an exclusive interview. You know, like, so. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, you're a funny guy. Are there specific examples you have where you kind of use humor? Uh, I think the not porn one is always one of my favorites. Okay. Uh, I try to do that. Um, another thing, it's mostly my subject lines, man. I try my best <laughs> to make funny subject lines. Uh, like the biggest one, I write a lot of copy. TJ's our head of sales. I write a lot of ad copy for the sales team. Um, not because you know they can't do it themselves, it's just because everybody thinks the so weird. Everybody thinks my shit's funnier, right? And gets more clicks and shit. So, uh, so yeah, uh, I think like down the data or uh, who's your data? Who's your data? Was one of my favorite ones. Uh, like we've used a lot of catchy subject lines to try to get people's attention, and that's one of my favorite things. Is pretty much like you know using uh, a catchy, funny subject line to kind of get their attention in a way, something that they haven't seen because they're seeing a ton of subject lines, man. A lot of bullshit too. A lot of them are just like. You know, top 10 ways to be successful with this, this, and this. You know, and they're like, shit, dude, I just read 20 articles on that about, you know, 10 minutes ago. So it's all about, like, but then whenever you're working for TechCrunch, you're scrolling down and you see not porn, you're like, what the hell is that? <laughs> you know, uh, don't sell my stuff to my I'm very close friends in the industry and they will help you. Uh, <laughs> what was that? Trade market. Yeah, trade market. <laughs> but uh, no, I think. That, uh, mostly the subject line in my intro, this is a huge thing too, in my pitches, and you know, I'm, I'm always open to send uh, examples to anybody, just reach out to me, I can send you examples of how I press. I love helping people with press. I work in marketing right now, I'm not shit about marketing, I'm kind of winging it half the time, but the PR shit, that's what I know about. Um, <laughs> and so, it's one of those things where like, you know, uh, I definitely changed the meat up, in the, in the, or, like, the meat of the beginning of the thing. Because, like I said, bullet points, right? So I have a ton of bullet points going down about all the information. But the top of it is, you know, hey, Steve, uh, you know, noticed that you were at App Masters last week and uh, looked like you guys were having a great time. I really wish I could have made it. Um, anyway, I was just hoping I'd get a few minutes every time to tell you about our app drunk mode and how we're kind of like, you know, doing some stuff, blah, 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 you know. And so, like, the top part is where I do try to introduce some humor. Some of the times, like, that was a bad example. Not that funny. <laughs> On the fly, right? Uh, so it's one of those things where like, during that top part where I'm kind of doing an intro, kind of like a warm, make them feel like, okay, this guy knows who I am, that kind of thing. I usually add a little humor in there, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't know of any other specific examples or jokes, but those are some of my favorite ones. Subject lines are, are great. So, anybody else? So what's your take on the in-house PR team versus the PR agency? Okay, so that's interesting. Uh, our guy, Josh, brought me in, not because of my PR knowledge, right? Uh, it was mainly because when I first met Josh, I was doing stand-up comedy in Tuscaloosa, getting my degree, finishing that up. Like I said, I ran across the app, thought it was bigger than it was. It was just Josh and Daquan. Um, <laughs> I thought it had a whole team. It was just two dudes, one engineer, and uh, they had a couple thousand dollars, right? Um, and so... Uh, PR right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, uh, one of the big things that he brought me in to do was just kind of like help make his spam less spammy, right? He never really thought about like the actual like PR stuff I could do until I started doing it. Um, so I think in-house PR is great, man. It's one of those things where like anytime there's a news story, like uh, like you know, help uh, was talking about uh, or heal, and a couple of other uh, the lady was saying is that like um. You know, you want to keep your story out there, you want to keep it like known, you want to keep people talking about it in a way. And so like in-house PR is the best way to do that because like every time you guys come out with an update, if you have somebody in-house, you can say, hey, here's the newest update we have, here's the newest stuff, you need to do a press release on it. And if you're hiring outside PR, you're not going to be their only client usually. So like it may be an expedient thing, it may be that. Um, I think for smaller folks, dude, I think like firms are weird, like in my opinion. I never worked at an Edelman or never worked at a PR firm. And I've had a lot of success in public relations. And so it's one of those things where if you can just find a dude who's like driven and creative and knows a little bit about PR, I mean, he can land your press without needing a whole agency, right? Um, I'm not necessarily against agencies, don't get me wrong. I think they're great. I think they offer a lot more than what I can do, right? But at the same time, uh, 
I know a lot of people who spend a lot of money on agencies and don't get shit from it. And it's just because like they can have all the connections in the industry and all of this other stuff and still not be able to execute. Uh, whereas someone who may be a founder will know more about the product, may know more about like what we can do to make this news, right? Um, I thought it was super important for us to have a PR guy in house, mainly because he gave me a job, but uh, also because you know, we work with location data, and uh, that can have a negative connotation, like I said earlier. And I, I know at Exmo, that's one of our big things is we're trying to help with transparency in the industry and help make it look a little bit better, you know? Uh, because for years, it's kind of been like a uh, kind of a shady industry in a way. And so, um, yeah, I think in house PR is important, but I think you can also outsource it. It's just kind of like up to you and your size. Uh, I think if you want to make one of the founders your PR guy, or if you have a founder that is a PR guy, that's good, in my opinion, because I think it helped us out tremendously. And so, yeah. Sweet.